All right, folks, here we go. Here's a very brief history of our Earth, looking at those four different time eras that we were talking about, right? So, first we have the Precambrian, right? Now, this is everything from the beginning of our planet 4.55 billion years ago up to 544 million years ago, right? Shortly after the formation of our Earth, we have the formation of our moon, right? About 3.5 billion years, or 3,500 million years ago, we get the first evidence of unicellular life. And a lot of it is this stuff here, which is known as banded iron formation. And we have a lot of this up in the UP. It's our primary source for, for iron in this country. Um, and what this is, is really, it's not the fossils themselves, it's the remains of them breathing. Back in our early oceans, there was no free oxygen. But uh, iron loves to be free, so it was floating around in our oceans. But even more than being mobile and free in water, iron loves oxygen. And if it finds an oxygen, it's going to grab to it and fall out as an iron oxide mineral. And that's what we're seeing here. Right? So when these first kind of photosynthetic plants, uh, single cell organisms started, right? Um, What's the byproduct of photosynthesis? Well, it's oxygen, right? That's released into the water, and then here comes an iron and grabs it up, right? So this is the fixing of a lot of iron due to that early bacterial action, right? About 2.3 billion years ago, and then from about 750 to about 30, 635 million years ago, we have what are called snowball Earths. And this is a period of time when the Earth froze over almost completely it's debatable uh, from pole to pole, right? And the important thing about between the 750 and 635 here, right? There we alternated between snowball earth and hothouse earth. And hothouse earth is when there is no ice on the planet, right? So it'll go snowball earth, hothouse earth, snowball earth, hothouse earth, right? About 600 million years ago, we get the, what's known as the Edicaria fauna. And this is the first evidence of either multicellular or colonial life. Uh, but this is about as exciting as it got here, folks. This is your Edicaria fauna. We have this uh, thing that looks like a leaf here. This is actually a filter feeding animal. Uh, and then we have little round blobs like this, which has been interpreted to be uh, jellyfish. But for the first, you know, four billion years of history of life on our planet, this is as exciting as it got, right? And then, all of a sudden, we get to the Paleozoic era. Paleo, again, meaning old. This means old life, right? You don't need to know these, necessarily, but these are the different time periods within the Paleozoic. And uh, the oldest of these is the Cambrian, named after Cambridge, England. And here we see the rise of the modern ores, and the Paleozoic starts off with what's known as the Cambrian Explosion. So we go from this kind of boring jellyfish thing to all of a sudden we have all our kind of modern groups of animals. We have, uh, we've got uh, corals, we have mollusks, we have um, uh, squids, we have these things called arthropods, we have echinoderms, we have crinoids, right? And even the very first, look how cute he is, His name is Pacaya, is the very first of our vertebrates, right? Right there at the beginning, right? In the Ordovician, we see our actual first true fish, right? Now I mentioned you don't need to know these different, uh, you know, time periods, but do know the things that happen in the Paleozoic, like first fish, modern orders, right? Silurian, so Devonian, and then the Mississippian, named after famous localities and guess where, Mississippi, we see the first land vertebrates, uh, fish, uh, or tetrapods moving on to land. And tetrapod is anything with a vertebrae that lives on land, including us, right? And then we have the Pennsylvanian, and then the last time period uh, in the Paleozoic is the Permian, right? And then the Paleozoic era ends with the largest mass extinction that has ever hit our planet. It's known as the Great Dying, or the Permo-Triassic extinction because it ends the Permian and starts the Triassic, which is the first period in the Mesozoic, right? This is the largest mass extinction that ever hurt our planet. 96% of all life, land, sea, and air, bit it, right? Probably over a few 
million years for a few different reasons, right? So again, when did the first vertebrates appear? We were there at the beginning, right? Pakaya, I mentioned he was found up in Canada. And then some exciting finds coming out of China. Haikuichthys and Mylocumingia. All right, here's the actual fossils and then kind of a reconstruction, right? Now, these are so primitive, these aren't even fish, but they are vertebrates because, importantly, they have a notochord, right, which is a vertebrate feature, right? Here are some actual true fish. These are armored fish. These are called placoderms. The biggest one was Dunkleosteus. He was the size of a school bus and had such strong jaws, he actually could probably take in bites out of that school bus, right? We also have some really crazy sharks that appear in the Paleozoic, right? Stacanthus, a shark that had kind of this plate on his head, right? We don't know what that was for. Uh, and Helicopyron, the buzzsaw shark, his lower jaw was actually a whirl of teeth that would just swim up to something, bite it in half, and then come back later. And that thing would be like 20, 25 feet long, like the size of a great white shark. Pretty crazy. We also had some interesting land critters, right? So here's the transition from fish onto land, the fish tetrapod transition. And we can show what's called homology, matching between the fish and that evolving into amphibian and then into reptile type ants. This is Eriops. He was one of the first uh, truly dedicated land vertebrates that we know of. Uh, he would have been an amphibian, right? Then this is Ichthyostega. He was halfway between a fish and uh, 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 um, amphibian, basically, right? He has some very fishy features, but importantly, he's got a sacrum with bones that are, are large enough now to support his weight on land. So we think that he probably lived most of his life in the water, but could go up on land to move to new ponds or whatever, right? We also had these cool things called mammal-like reptiles, right? Now, I know these are often included in your dinosaur play sets, but these are not dinosaurs, right? These are mammal-like reptiles that are actually closer related to us than they are to dinosaurs. Right? Here's some more of those interesting critters. All of these are mammal-like reptiles. And then again, it ends with the Permo-Triassic mass extinction, the great dying, the largest mass extinction that ever hit our planet. Again, this probably took, you know, a couple million years for a few different reasons, like shutting down of ocean circulation patterns and stuff like that. But it was the largest mass extinction, right? The interesting thing about mass extinctions, though, is when you kill off a whole bunch of species, what you have are basically all these now open ecological niches, right? It's basically like job openings. So usually after you see a mass extinction, you see a mass evolution, which is also known as a radiation, right? So then, you know, a new set of critters comes in and kind of takes over um, these, these, uh, these biological niches, right? And in the Mesozoic, that was the dinosaurs, right? They were kind of the biggest, baddest kings of creation back then. Right. This is the age of the dinosaurs, the Mesozoic era. Right. Right at the beginning, right after the uh, Permo Triassic mass extinction, we get the first dinosaurs. But importantly, we also get the first mammals. Right. Now, many people think that mammals didn't come along until after the dinosaurs went extinct. That's not true. We're there the whole time. We're just scurrying around trying not to get stepped on. One of the biggest mammals in the in the entire Mesozoic is probably about the size of a small dog. Right. Then in the Jurassic, we have the first true birds, birds evolving from all these guys right here, not necessarily T-Rex himself, but his relatives, the theropod or meat-eating, running on two legs type of dinosaurs. And then we have the Cretaceous, right? Um, this is the youngest of the periods, and the Mesozoic ends and the Cretaceous ends with the extinction of the dinosaurs. Well, now we say the non-avian dinosaurs because now birds by most scientists are considered simply a branch of dinosaurs so when you're sitting there having thanksgiving dinner you really are ripping into a delicious little tiny dinosaur according to scientists right so here's some uh some of the fun things that happened in the mesozoic uh the evolution of the first mammals morganachodon here is about the size of maybe your thumbnail very small but you can see this transition from these mammal-like reptiles into our modern mammals right Here's some early dinosaurs. The theropod dinosaurs were there from the beginning. This guy, Platyosaurus, what kind of dinosaur he's, is he going to evolve into? 
You can kind of see those long neck, like the Brachiosaurus and stuff like that. Right? Largest dinosaur known is called Patagotitan. He's from Patagonia. He would have weighed 152,000 pounds and would have been 112 feet long. Right? Here's some uh, uh, part of that early bird, dinosaur bird transition, right? So this one here is called Microraptor, and he is a true dinosaur. And this one is Archaeopteryx, and he is a true bird. Would you please tell me the difference? Well, one difference is it seems that Archaeopteryx uh, had powered flight, whereas this was more like a glider, like a you know flying squirrel or something like that. Right? We also had giant flying reptiles in the Mesozoic. Now, these again were not dinosaurs, even though they're always in your dinosaur play sets. These are flying reptiles, the biggest one being Quetzalcoatlus, would have been the size of a small Cessna aircraft. We also have marine reptiles. Again, no, these are not dinosaurs. There were no flying or swimming dinosaurs except for the birds. Here we have marine reptiles, right? This guy is supposed to be uh, the Loch Ness Monster or something. Mosasaur and Ichthyosaurs, right? All of these in the Mesozoic. And then the Mesozoic ends with another mass extinction, the second largest mass extinction ever to hit our planet. This one is called the KT or KPG mass extinction. So it uh, marks the boundary between the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic. And unlike the last mass extinction, this one was a line in the sand, was probably instantaneous. Our best guesses are it was due to a six mile wide asteroid hitting the Yucatan Peninsula and causing worldwide catastrophe, right? Now, of course, we know some dinosaurs did survive and those are the birds, the avian dinosaurs, right? And then our modern era, the Cenozoic era, right? This is the age of mammals. Now, as I mentioned before, mammals were around the whole time of dinosaurs but we were just small, right? This is where, you know, all those those ecological niches, those higher predatory and so niches that were occupied by the dinosaurs. Now that those dinosaurs are gone, the mammals experience a mass radiation and quickly evolve in to fill some of these niches, right? In the, the oldest part, the tertiary, we get our first primates. A lot of that uh, evolution happening here in the United States, actually. Um, some of the stuff I work on in, out west, right? And not until, again, the quaternary, we get the first humans going back to 200,000 years or so, uh, being generous with the terms human. Right? Let's check out some other fun things that happened here. Right? So, again, mammals take over. We see the first primates. We see the first whales. And we see the first humans. Right? Whale evolution is a fun story. If in the Paleozoic we saw fish crawling up onto land, now we see land mammals crawling back into the sea. So one of the earliest relatives, so here's our modern whales, right? The earliest one that you would say is definitely a whale with this guy Amblyocetus. And he didn't live in the open ocean. He would have lived in swamps and, and river estuaries and stuff and probably was an ambush hunter filling a role like quite a, like a crocodile, actually, right? But right before uh, Amblyocetus, the previous one is Pachyocetus, right? Look at that. You can tell that's an animal that is created to live on land, right? But look at the jaw. Look at the skull. That is a whale skull if there ever was one, right? So this is a fun lineage to look into, too, is the, the history of whale evolution, right? And paleoanthropology is the study of human origins, right? The study of us as a species, right? Uh, it is, you know, important to know kind of that the biggest egos in paleontology live here. And often uh, there are lots of, you know, high contentious fights to be the fun one to find the oldest, the best human relatives, right? And how you depend... Uh, classify human species fossil human species is going to kind of depend on which camp or which advisor you have right so here's one way of looking at it back into history so this is now this is going back right we found you know fossils that we can say pretty def definitively we're standing upright and walking upright at about six and a half million years seven million years ago right and then you know, the fossil record's a little incomplete, but as we can see in here, there's a lot of stuff happening, right? This is the way it is with most uh, uh, branches of evolution of, of whatever group. It's a it's more of a bush than, than, it's not a ladder, this one to that one to that one to that one. It's more of a bush with, you know, lots of these different uh, 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 branches dying off at, at different places, right? 
and just kind of relating all of this back to Earth processes and time, there have historically been kind of two competing theories of how our, our current landforms develop. One is catastrophism. This is that the Earth, uh, the features that we see on our Earth are a result of catastrophic events, large meteorite impacts, floods, volcanic eruptions, that kind of stuff. The other side said, well, uniformitarianism is actually the idea, right? You know, so the slow process you see of meandering rivers and streams and deposition and erosion, that is what is, is causing, you know, our current landforms. And of course, now we kind of say, well, you know, all of these are important, right? And our modern synthesis is that we use both catastrophic, it takes both catastrophic and just normal processes to define our planet, right? All right, have a good day, folks.